Hi, it's Gadget UK here again, back for part two of the Amstrad CPC 6128 128K color personal computer. In the previous video, we looked at the floppy drive, but as I showed towards the end of that video, I want to fit a GoTek in here. Now, I thought long and hard about this. It's not something I typically do. You'll notice on Anime Amiga videos, have you ever seen a GoTek? I haven't fitted one because I don't see any need with the Amiga. Uh, floppy drives are, in my mind, painful to use on systems when you can load things from a hard disk, yeah? So like the Amiga, is very easy to set up WHD load on a compact flash card in the different systems there. You might need, uh, you know, some sort of upgrade to give you a compact flash card in an Amiga, but it's the best way to use those systems, so that's why I generally don't go with GoTek on Amigas. Uh, now, the exception was on my Atari ST. When I got that Atari ST, I had a big hole in the side where someone had, you know, cut out the plastic larger than the, uh, you know, where the drive would normally be. So I had to do something, and I thought, well, I may as well stick a GoTek in that uh, because it's an eyesore already. Um, and at the time, I didn't have a hard disk adapter, so it kind of made sense with the Atari ST. But with the CPC, and the reason why it took me a while to, to think about what to do here, what I prefer to do is get this disk drive working. Well, we've done that, we've achieved that. The next thing would be to get a load of games to test with, because one disc on its own like this is not really sufficient. But try finding CPC discs, and try finding CPC discs that are affordable. This was five quid, which, uh, you know, it's an awful game. Five quid just for the, the disc like that, with no box or anything. Most of the games that you would care about, uh, sort of 30 to 50 pounds upwards, some of them as much as 100 pounds. Um, and this is the thing, so if you're a CPC fan and you've been collecting these things for the last 20 years, you'll have built up uh, quite a large collection and many of the games you've bought for pounds or pennies in the years gone by. But at the moment, the value of these things shot up through the roof, which means I'm never going to own more than a few discs for this, which seems a waste. You know, I can't really load anything. So I could use the DIN here, connect to tape deck, or use something like a ZX Duino, you know, uh, I think there's one called a Max Duino. Works with different 8-bit uh, systems like this, like, you know, the CPC, the Dragon, uh, Amstrad, uh, and I think BBC as well, actually. So you could load tapes from an SD card that way, but obviously, you know, it takes a period of time for tapes to load in, and I think not all of the tape formats are supported. There are some that have got a specific ID, that even the Max Duino, I don't think works properly with. Could be wrong, because I read something about a recent update actually on the Max Duino. But nevertheless, on a disk-based system, it's going to be better to have a disk drive, I think. So this was my reasoning behind going with GoTek. So what I'm trying to do with this, I'm bidding on an external drive enclosure for this, and I'll take this out in a minute, we'll fit this, and then I'll fit the original 3-inch drive here in the external enclosure, which would mean, as long as I get the right cable, I can get that to the back, and I think we can use the disk drive as an external drive. I'm not sure whether you can boot things like this from the second can drive in the chain there. I am honestly not sure. Um, but it's just one way to keep this and utilize it, I guess, rather than just putting it in a box somewhere never to be seen again. So I guess we'll need to unscrew the drive again. I think the drive should come out of this metal bracket here, and then I think the GoTek hopefully should screw into that. Now I went for a kit here, you know, someone's already produced this GoTek in mind with the CPC, you know, so what I mean by that is it's got this little adapter here, you know, normally of the connector there and you just have a cable coming off or some, uh, you know, a custom cable or something, but it's got this little PCB here, which is needed if you want to use it with the CPC, uh, but it's also got 3D printed front here, you know, uh, housing to hold it, which is really nice, an OLED screen, uh, and everything just looks nice there from the front, it's really nicely printed. The one thing I would say, can you see this, these little white marks there? Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know, it could do with the screen taking out and smoothing down a little bit. The top edge there doesn't suffer from that. Um, and the other thing with this, I noticed, look at the quality here. The quality here is exceptional. They'd have been better off printing this another way around and having this smooth surface here as the front. But, I don't know, some people might like that uh, ridged uh, appearance there. Personally, I prefer the nice flat part like that as the front. So, anyway, that's just an idea. Um, and I think this is all configured now to work with the CPC. I think the jumpers and things here are set that way, and the jumpers on this little adapter will be set that way. So before I uh, connect it up uh, to the metal part, you know, the bracket, let's uh, just try... And it, obviously it's got a power adapter here. Can you see this? 
It's got this little adapter so let's uh, connect the power. And I've got a little uh, USB thumb drive here, 32 gig, way bigger than I actually need. You could probably fit everything on 2 gig or 4 gig, probably. Um, but it was quite cheap, it's like five pounds. So let's see if we can get that in. Hang on, there we go. So let's just loosely test it like that. I've switched the power on there, and hopefully, you can see the screen there auto boot. Very nice. So I put the auto boot thing on there. Let's just see if we can boot from that. Now, that auto boot is designed to work with a HXC which is the precursor to the GoTech. Um, so, it's anybody's guess, will this work? I don't know, let's try cat. Now, I'm assuming we're not gonna get sound, no we're not. We need to have a little speaker, I might do that. Um, presuming it supports the speaker. So if we do her, uh, I don't know how you do this now. Run HXC, I guess. I'm not that familiar with the, uh, hang on, why haven't we got H there? Hang on, the H isn't working. That's interesting, never either key apart from H works. So I need to do something there with a H. Oh, that is annoying. So I can't get any further without the H key at the moment. So I'm gonna take the keyboard to pieces, I think. And I know it's not here because every other key, you know, works in the columns and rows. Anyway, we'll disconnect these, I think. So let's do this just carefully. Pull these up and out. I'll inspect them in a sec. Yeah, those have never been disconnected before. They look uh, good as new, I think. And then we've got this small connector over here, this uh, little one with the blue and black wire. Let's just try and pull that out. There we go. Uh, and one down here as well, actually. Probably for the LED or something. It might be the speaker. One's the speaker, I think. One's the LED. There we go. Let's that out. Anyway, let's just get these screws out here. And then we'll get the keyboard to bits, I think. Yeah, maybe it never had those screws on the bottom side here, because it does have three on the top side. Yeah, maybe these points here are held by the ones that go through the case. That's a possibility. That might be why there's no screws at those points. I did try just pulling the keycap off for that specific key, by the way. There's nothing really to see. It's not obvious that there's any corrosion or anything on the membrane or anything like that. So we will have to separate the back part here, you know, this metal plate. The best way to do this is, you know, to go across like that. I've done all these ones here. Hang on, that one's not through. There you go, that's through. Just one more here, I think. Is that going to come off? Yeah, there we go. Yeah, ouch. That has had some spills and things. Look, can you see up here? Yeah, stuff's been spilt on that in the past. Let's take it over to the mat and we'll wipe it down with some uh, IPA, I think. Let's just carefully try and peel this up here. Oh, yeah, look at this. Wow. It could just be dust and dirt. Look at all the fluff on there. So we'll get the uh, vacuum onto this as well, get all this out of there, that's not going to be helping is it? Although I don't see any around the H key. So this particular membrane I can wipe with some IPA. Not all membranes you can, it depends whether the see these traces, depends which side they're on. If they're on the outside here, you wouldn't want to do it uh, with IPA. But uh, yeah, I'm comfortable with this just from inspecting it on both sides. But, uh, the connections and things are on the inside. There's two layers that are sandwiched together and the connection parts are on the inside. It does of course mean cleaning it like this is not going to solve anything if you know you've got some contaminants between the little uh, pads there but we do need to just clean it up anyway just have a look see what uh, state it's in. Inspect to see whether we can see any corroded traces. So without aligning this up with the keyboard I'm not sure where the H key is, but I see a bit of discoloration. You might just be able to see there, I don't know. I might have to put your macro. Yeah, just that one trace there, so maybe, I don't know, maybe there is an issue with the membrane. I'm tempted now just to connect this up and uh, just have a bit of a press around here and see if it works, actually. So I just plugged back in there. Uh, yeah, pressing this here, I get a G, no H. Doesn't really matter how I press that. So I think it's gonna be one of the traces here. Yeah, J's alright, and all the keys around it are okay, which is uh, really weird. Because you'd expect more than one key to be affected by this, but seemingly it's just the one key. So you're on Super Macro here. It is the part that I previously pointed out. Can you see here? We've got a complete gap there. Now bear in mind, there's a plastic layer over this, so it's not like we've wiped it off. It's internal, yeah? 
Uh, now there's two sides to this. The other side of the membrane, you can see this black bit here. If you flipped it over and look at it, it looks like one of these traces here. So it's like you've got this uh, greyish white or cream sort of colour um, on one side with the black bit on the other. Yeah. What I think I'm going to need to do here, we've got nothing to lose because this is never going to work. Uh, scratch a little bit over here. And I'm going to have to do it very carefully. You need it to be on a hard surface, not on something soft like this. Put it on a piece of metal or something. And we need to very carefully use a craft knife. Scratch, scratch, scratch. Very, very carefully. Tiny, tiny, tiny little bit. You want to be getting microns off each time until eventually you start to disturb the layer below. Then get some conductive ink. Uh, do the same thing over here, by the way. Uh, it's going to have to be over there somewhere because it's a bit disintegrated all around here as well as that point uh, but if we scratch off here scratch 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 and then just trail some uh, conductive ink it sets to like one ohm or something so stick something like that over there hopefully this will get this up and running if it doesn't it's going to need a new membrane we've got nothing to lose it's not going to work without doing something here so will this ever work again i'm not so sure you can see i uh, tried to scratch here and it's can you see it smushed it out it's gone thicker. That shows to me that the, the black carbon stuff has spread from the pressure. Uh, anyway, so I was getting nowhere and trying to scratch this off to get through to it is near impossible. So I start to separate it with a knife. So as you can see, uh, and you've got to be very careful, this may never work again, but I've managed to get right down on, to the bit that's affected. And can you see on the top layer here, can you see it's floating because it's rubbed off on there. And if I can sort of spread this just carefully, you've got to be careful not to crease it. And you've also got to be trying careful not to rub the traces and things, which yeah, which is why it may never work again. Uh, can you just about see down here? This is the point we're dealing with and there are some breaks in it there. So I'm just going to get a bit of conductive ink across there. Keep it separate like this, I'll, I don't know, I'll stick something in there just to stop it from joining up. Let it dry, and then we'll reassemble it and test it. There may be another one that's affected, maybe even from separating these, I might damage one, but I've got nothing to lose here. It's either do this or try and find a new membrane. You can't get new ones, I don't think, for a 6128. So I've got the craft uh, knife just separating the two halves here, so you can see where it was rubbed off here on the top part when I tried to scratch away. And just below it, can you see we've got quite a big blob? So it does look a mess. It's not a nice, tidy, straight line. If you separate the membranes totally here, then you'll be able to do a really tidy, clean job. But there is risk. And what I mean by that is you try to separate these, all this white stuff here is where it's kind of glued, included around these here. So it's very, very difficult to try and separate these. It's not just like split all the edges and it comes apart. All the centre parts are joined around these post things here. Those are joined. So you could very easily create more damage just by virtue of trying to get in there. But I think it's crossed. I think I've got away with it. It's just a question of whether any of the keys are affected. I didn't mention it, but when I came to test the keyboard when the H key wasn't working, there was a row up here that wasn't working. Now I found just from pressing there, getting the H key working, I have had the H key working. If you press in that area that's damaged, you can get the H back and then this row here came back. But I think we're missing this key here. So surprisingly, it works. Now I speeded up the drain process with a bit of hot air, 100 degrees for about 20 or 30 seconds. I did it on the inside uh, where I could and on the outside and just finger touched to make sure it was dry and it is. Uh, hang on, if I press H there, it's working. Uh, the key next to it, G. Whether we've adversely affected any other keys remains to be seen on the one on the other side. Try H again. Yay, sweet. Uh, now the two key is not working. As I mentioned before, so I think, uh, is it that one? No, it's not that one. This one here, this key here, it's not doing anything. That one works, that one works, and all the others around here work. Yeah, that row wasn't working before, it is now we've fixed the H. So it's just that one, I'm going to mark that one up and then inspect, try and follow its trace, see where it goes and see if there's uh, damage elsewhere. So I might need to separate this half now in order to fix whichever key is broken there. So you can see that looks a mess, can you see? It's a bit of a blob, but uh, it's a nice thick reliable connection, that's not going to break again anytime soon. And here's the other one, so I followed it from this key here, it's the diagonal trace that comes up along here, goes all the way down here, around up here, and it's this inside edge here. This is affected here. 
it's this part here so it's a bit better in the sense it's quite close to the top here so I can peel on this corner here peel this all back you know to about there very carefully and then just uh, paint the trace here and I think we should be done so I'll show you this bit because we uh, cut corners on the uh, last one I just uh, did it and uh, didn't show you so it's a case of getting the knife here and just keep pressing there you go press into the edge can you see that it's coming in here and then separate be very careful not to touch these traces here separate like this we'll go all the way down here I think that'll do Let's try and uh, find where we just uh, started on that corner again wherever it was there you go the knife goes in really easily again I'm watching the end of the blade there I don't want to go near that trace and uh, continue now this bit's difficult because can you see how close the trace is to the bit we're separating so yeah very careful and slowly stuck there uh, it's stuck on this corner here look what we'll have to do here is come into the corner I think try and get it oh, it's really difficult there we go uh, yeah pick up where we left off here and then just slide over here again watch out for this trace here all the way along there and we need to kind of go here now this is right next to the trace here so I'm not actually going to go up to the trace I'll just peel it back in a minute and hopefully we won't do any further damage we're stuck on the bit here again so I'm going to need to go in again here if we can hang on there we go very carefully yeah this bit's already been separated so if we sort of grab it yeah, this is the tricky bit now trying to grab the bits you've peeled here and try not to crease this because if you crease this this will damage it so it, it, as I say it's easier said than done this you've got to be really slow in your approach here can you see it's like stuck on the circular bits look they're kind of like all joined again be aware you don't want creases creases are bad news and the angle is everything. Can you see the angle I'm separating this at? Try and keep them from being creased effectively. Just a little bit, a little bit. And if you do touch this, try stay away from anything with the connections on it. Because any kind of uh, mark, rub, pressure, you know, I nearly touched that black bit there then, could create more problems. Slowly, slowly. We're getting to the area now, aren't we? It's just here where my thumb is. Yeah, there we go. You can see little black bits coming off, look. Right, there's the damage. Can you see it? Where the screwdriver is, the ink is worn away on this whole stretch here. And again, I'll show you this bit, because we didn't. This is the stuff I'm using, electric paint here. This is really good. This is the best of this type of conductive paint I've come across. So I'll get quite a large blob, because it's a bit longer. Uh, now you could use a brush, I'm just choosing to use the screwdriver here and just make a bit of a blobby mess with it. You can see it here, I'll zoom in in a minute. So yeah, again, not easy to do and film. Uh, I'm just going to start up here. So yeah, blobby mess, it doesn't matter, there's nothing too short to just keep adding a little bit more and uh, trail it. There we go, over to where it wants to go. I almost got some to the other trace there, can you see that? Anyway, I'll report back in a minute. There we go, the world's uh, blobbiest painting. Oh. I never claim to be a, an artist. I'm going to use uh, hot air, so I'll just wait for the hot air to cool down because it overshoots to about 150, 160 degrees and wait for it to go down to about 100. And then we're just going to just heat this area. It speeds up the drain uh, exponentially. I mean, like, you know, instead of an hour, you're down to about 30 seconds. pulling away a bit because I can feel it getting a bit hot let's just have a go from underneath it does look a mess I'll be the first one there but as I say what are you going to do all you're going to do you need a new membrane no alternative a few people 
piping up and I've seen other videos people going oh these conductive ink things don't work your keyboard you can't fix your keyboard with them it won't last it does last if you do a proper job like this and you've not damaged to create any of the damage it will last I've got about six or seven keyboards I've done this on now and you know what every one of them still works and I use some of them a lot so I'll just give it the uh, touch test yeah that's right yeah, it's completely dry. So yeah, it's a bit blobby here. If you get it too blobby, you might get problems where the conductivity is not going to be good. But then again, you get the point where the spring contacts the pad above and it presses down quite a lot anyway, so it probably wouldn't make that much of a difference. Uh, you can see where it's a bit messy there. I had to use a cotton bud to try and get some off because I almost joined it up to the other trace. So hopefully we won't have any kind of resistance there between those. Let's now just put that back together and let's go and test it. So the two keys still not working, I think I know why. If I just measure connectivity, uh, let's put it on ohms actually, just measure resistance, so very carefully touch the pad side on. I've mentioned this before, if you pr stab into them you'll destroy them. Uh, hang on, see that? 5 ohms. Yeah, and if I, I just do the same sort of thing, hold that there. Be careful not to move it around or rub the surface off, this is very hard to do. And if we measure to the uh, the one here, hang on, oh, probes annoying me. Uh, watch the resistance, look at that, 5k. A minute ago it was 12k, and if I ho hover over this, just try and do it without rubbing away at it, hang on. See it's going down, 5.3k. It goes, it's going up a little bit, watch, but then it's going down. Gradually going down. It's because, even though we've dried that so it's touch uh, OK to touch, the centre of it is not dry. So a few minutes later, let's uh, test it again. I imagine it's uh, not a dead short yet, but uh, yeah, still not registering. So I'll report back in a minute. All the other keys seem okay. It does seem to be just that one key. Woohoo, it's working. I measured the resistance all the way down, kept checking it. As soon as it got to 2K, ironically it's 2, and when it got to 2K, it started working. Now bear in mind, it will go a lot less than that. I think it sets about 160 ohms, this uh, conductive ink. The reason the H key worked super quick, I'll show you that, yeah, as soon as the, re the reason that works straight away after I dried it is because it's a really short, tiny little bit that we've painted. This is quite a lot longer, like seven or eight times longer. Uh, but anyway, nevertheless, that has fixed it. So I'm going to clean up the dust and fluff out of the keyboard shell, reassemble it, and just test all the keys work. So I just uh, gave it a bit of a hoover. I will clean the keycaps up later, I think. Uh, you can see it's a bit dirty, so I'll certainly clean around the outside here. And any individual keycaps I'll clean up uh, myself, probably off camera. I've stripped a keyboard like this down before on that CPC 464 video. But the thing I wanted to point out here, the best way to get these keycaps off, you can just use a keycap puller, you know, just clip it around the thing sides there, just pull it off. But with the larger keys, just like on the 464, they've got these bars and they're on the underneath of the keyboard here. So the best thing to do is do what I did, you know, remove the metal back here, as you saw me unclip earlier on, uh, and then you can unclip these things here, you know, these larger keys, without breaking them, you know, and it's literally just a case of, let's see if I can show you, and just like the 464, it's just a case of trying to grab these bars like this. Can you see it pull off there, look? On that side, you do the same on the other one, and then the bars come off, and then you can literally pull the key through the other side. But And then obviously repeat, uh, reverse the process like that, you know, clip each bar, each side of the bar on, uh, in order to reassemble it. Anyway, that's nice and clean on the inside. Uh, you might need to be careful you don't lose these springs when you vacuum, but they stuck in pretty well actually so I think you'd be all right you know I didn't lose any there vacuuming that but what you would want to do probably is pull every single one of these keys off soak them in the sink I'm not going to do that though because uh, other than some dirt around the outside I can just clean this particular keyboard from the uh, outside pretty easily I might pull the odd key off because you can see there's a little bit of fluff or something under there so uh, yeah that's the approach with this one just to expedite things but I might revisit this and pull the keycaps off you know there's nothing to it you've seen it all before on the 464 video 
if on every one of my videos I did the same thing, you know, stripping the keyboards right down, pulling the key cups off, sticking it all in the sink, it just gets a bit samey, doesn't it? So, uh, and it does for me as well, you know, I've got finite time here for these videos, and uh, I need to try and bring different things to show you and stuff instead of just covering the same old things. The other reason you'll want to clean the keys up on one of these, can I show you this? Let me show you, hang on. Look, corroded spring. So, yeah, I will take all the keys off this uh, at some point. I might do it as a separate video. Uh, you, at the very least, you want to get the root corrosion off that spring there. But also, you know, clean up uh, around the key area as well there. Anyway, as I say, I'm going to do that as a separate video, I think. We use these posts here as a guide. You can't get it around the wrong way there. Uh, hang on. Is it that way? Yes, yeah, that way. Like that. So, yeah, it's uh, a lot cleaner. You can still see marks and things on it, but trust me, that's a really good wipe with IPA. Uh, before I stick this back on, I need to remove all this blooming corrosion from here down there with the wire brush and the fiberglass pen. And there you go, that's the sort of level you need to get it to where there are no bits of red rust. So I could get that a bit better, you can see there's just the odd little bit of redness to it, but all of the corrosion has uh, gone off that. I've wiped it with, uh, let's say, a very thin coat of WD-40. You could use, let's say, uh, just a general purpose oil or something. You just want to stop the uh, corrosion starting again. Uh, with uh, WD-40 being a solvent, it should do the trick. So if it just clips together, work our way across and I'm sure you've already gathered the keyboard works fine <laughs> it's fantastic everything works now sweet anyway I'll just uh, reboot it we'll uh, I'll show you the HXE stuff again hang on so I'll switch it on again and I'll type uh, cat now bear in mind the H wasn't working before for us H H is working and the F2 key wasn't working and that's working and I think every other key is working. If we do cure to UIOP. And the dot. Sweet. The only one I didn't press there was escape. But yeah, that works as well. So the keyboard is solid. So if I type cat again, is it on Pinball Dreams? Yeah, it is. Uh, I'm not sure how you get back to the uh, auto boot thing. Just trying to press the buttons on the front of the drive here. Oh, yeah, here we go. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Oh, these are the different slots. Oh, there we go. Auto boot. So, let's try that. Yeah, it's my first time actually using a GoTek. So, the interface is subtly different. So, you can see that this is the problem we had before. We couldn't type a H. So, if we do run HXC. We can now load the disk manager there. That's what auto boot does, it's a disk manager. Now I'm not familiar with the, I press H there, H for help. I was gonna say, I'm not familiar with the controls for this, I'm not sure what key does what. Press H, so up, down, left, right, navigate, control, left, control, right, it's previous next slot. Space is enter or select. So I think what I did is I set pinball dreams as slot one. S slot list, let's try that. Yeah, there we go. Look, it's put them in all slots. I must have pressed it multiple times. So if we find a game, let's uh, use the arrow keys here. We're going to uh, homebrew. So these are some of the homebrew games that I've picked up over the last year or two. Is that our type? Looks like an A. Let's try that. So we've pressed return. Oh yeah, that. I don't know if you saw that. That went 0-2 there. So it's done slot 1. Escape is quit. Let's try that, escape. Save, yes. So I think slot one should be R type. I don't know if it's on slot one or is it on slot two, let's see. Oh yeah, there we go. Because it does that automatically when you do a cat look. I remember that, and you just press return, I think, do you? Or did you have to go to the right and do run disk? I think you did. It's ages since I loaded this. I usually play this on the 464 there with the uh, memory expansion using the DDI3. Sweet. That's it, space. Awesome. There's been
been some really good homebrew games for the CPC. It's a shame the Ghosts and Goblins uh, port has not been able to be backport to something like the 6128. It'll work on the Plus machines, I think, but it needs the Plus hardware, if I understand that new Ghosts and Goblins. But from what I believe, there was another uh, Ghosts and Goblins in the works as well. I'm not sure if that was, again, aimed at the GX4000 and the Plus hardware. play this from the right hand at a distance. <laughs> so let's now take this mounting bracket off the side of the three inch disk drive here and then we can mount it on the GoTech and uh, properly fit the GoTech in there. As I say this drive my plans are to do this in an external enclosure and of course one of the benefits if you do something like that is you can convert your original discs I think just using the right software you can read from your external drive to the GoTech. I'm not sure if there are any copy protection schemes on three inch discs like there were on three and a half inch discs so there might be instances where you need special hardware to copy the discs. Just disconnected the wires to try and make this a bit easier because uh, it was proven pretty difficult to try and get these screws in here. I'm not sure if these holes have been previously drilled for a screw or oh, no. there we go seems to fit and then hopefully yeah that's going to mount in just the right position there isn't it tuck it under there sweet and then we should be able to use these two screws here to screw that plate in so the drive isn't going to go anywhere put our ground strap there bear in mind depending on how dirty your system is you might want to take the board out I can clean the bits of plastic that are exposed here and I'll be taking the motherboard out in a bit I think is that lined up? Let's just undo this one a bit. I'm not sure if that's in exactly... There we go. The right spot there. Now it is. And just connect the power back up. That's it. And if we just uh, tilt the lid over here. So you can see from the front there, that's not too bad that. Not too bad at all. Yeah, let's try it now. Cat. Disc missing. That's a bit worrying. There isn't a disc missing. Yeah, it's on the R-type disc. Why is it not showing up? Well, the really weird thing is, if I connect back to the original disc drive, the original disc drive's working, so something's gone wrong with the GoTech. So the issue with the disc missing thing drove me nuts. I spent two or three hours yesterday evening getting pretty stressed with this, thinking, oh my goodness, has this died already? Did I kill it? Was it some ESD? What's gone on with this? And I, I spent quite a while searching on the internet, trying to understand what might have happened to this. And I was considering things like updating the firmware on it. Now, this is on the latest version of the firmware, I think. Um, and I held back on the updating the firmware option, but what I was looking at is other ways to configure this. And it turns out there are a few. The USB memory stick here, if you stick a file in the root of it called ff.cfg, the fast file system version of firmware that's on here, apparently looks at that CFG file. So you can use that CFG file to configure the interface and the drive characteristics, you know, is it a I don't know, for an IBM PC, is it some of the weird bespoke format like it is here, three inch drive, etc. Uh, and the host, like I say, you can say, is it an Amstrad, is it an Atari, is it an Amiga, what is it? Um, so that was where I ended up and I thought, okay, well, let's try and configure it. Now it turns out you can do that. You hold both the buttons down here when there's no stick in, and I'll show you that in a minute. And that takes you into a menu. Now, the curious thing, and I'm not really sure someone thought this through when they designed that version of the firmware, actually, or certainly this version of the GoTech, because it's only got two buttons. Now, I think you can get GoTechs with three buttons, or you get the one with the, and I think that's what that little pad's for there, rotary encoder. So you can use a little rotary encoder to go left, right, and pr maybe push it in to click, to select. So you've got, you know, three things, left, right, click. Does that make sense? But we only got two buttons, so you can go left, right in the menu, you can't select an option so it's like you get into the menu and it says like main menu and then you've got configuration or settings well you can't go into it and then there's the same with the other options you can update the firmware you can't start the firmware update because you can't select the darn thing so that is a bit of a pain now I was looking at other guides various guides not for the specific of this board but the GoTech in general how do you 
add a third button and it turns out where this jumper is here across these two pins the two pins there so like not the first two on uh, this uh, column here if you like the second column that is the switch contact for the third button so I was like well why is it across here like that and I'm guessing maybe they're pulling it to ground or pulling it to VCC um, and maybe that's something to do with the way this particular one is configured you know if you have that there it knows it's two buttons and you just go with the whole two button thing so I took that off tried it without it went into the menu and I just accidentally managed to reset the settings it just because I'll show you I'll recreate it what happens is when you go into the menu without the USB in there if you've not got this jumper on it thinks that switch has been pressed so when the menu comes up the first option is reset for the firmware settings it's not it's not like the firmware it's actually the settings it uses to you know configure the thing uh, it resets those and it did that automatically so when it happened I was like oh my god is this going to cause me another problem now no it's accidentally reset I didn't, no, didn't even choose that what I was trying to do is and it had a I'll show you I had a little wire here and I was going to go through the menu options go into the bit where you configure the drive type and the interface and I was going to I had one pin on there and I was going to go like click to select, click to select, that didn't happen. Just by virtue of having this jumper off it was automatically selected. Uh, anyway, I'll show you that. So if I switch this on and uh, just carefully lift this up, now I'll show you. So you can see everything's normal there, let's just remove the USB memory stick. So it says flash floppy 3.21 and I think if you hold these two buttons down, watch, one, two, about five seconds I think it is. See that? Look, the first option is reset flash configuration. It's gone out of the menu now, look on its own. Anyway, so that's how you do it. And if this jumper's off here, it will automatically select that option. And it, that seems to have fixed it, that solved it. But I'll be honest, I spent ages trying to work that out. Um, and as I mentioned a minute ago, I reconnected this drive this worked fine. So I knew it wasn't a problem with the WDC, uh, you know, the 765 controller, the floppy drive controller. I knew that wasn't the issue. It's probably an equivalent on here. I think this one's got a UM8272A. But that's the sort of thing you would want to check, just to rule out you've not damaged your floppy controller interface or something. Anyway, hopefully that's uh, working again. And doing a cat there, you can see that is working. It's uh, bringing back uh, whatever that is. I think this is uh, school days, actually. Sweet. So everything is good now. Go tech working, keyboard perfect, every key works. The next thing we're going to do is just uh, clean up. I think I might just uh, try and just disconnect the motherboard here. Uh, clean up the uh, inside of the case a little bit. We've cleaned up around there. I didn't show you when I removed that drive. I cleaned around the cavity and stuff there, so that's quite clean. The other thing that would probably be a good idea on this is to clean up this power switch here, actually. So I might just uh, do that before I take the board out. But I do need to get this board out to have a look on the underside. I might do what I did on the 464 and fit a couple of additional caps, actually. I mean, this board is not too bad because there's quite a lot of caps here. And you do have the odd one like that there. But I may stick one under the gate array, just like I did on the 464 video. And stick one under the uh, graphics chip here. So I'll disconnect that uh, 12 volt cable there again. Can stick that back on in a minute. The power switch connector comes off there like that, I think. And then the power switch probably just yeah, lifts out like that. So we'll sort that in a sec. But we need to get the remaining screws out. That's a relay, an Omron relay. So that relay there is going to be used to control the uh, tape port here. You know, so when you, you press play, it doesn't actually start playing. But when the relay engages, you know, via the CPC controlling it, uh, from the PIA, I think, actually, the uh, tape will then start playing. And if it wants to pause it itself, it can do that via the PIA again. Uh, you know, that you'll hear a click, probably. It might be quite quiet, that, I don't know. At some point, I'll get a cassette deck connected up to this. Got one uh, covert screw here, just under there. Let's just lift that cable grip. Yeah, you're not going to be able to see it, but trust me, it's there, right next to the IDC connector of the floppy drive. And incidentally, the IDC connector, you cannot disconnect it. Well, you can, but you'll damage the uh, cable, probably. You know, it's, it's crimped. Can you see that? Uh, like all IDC connectors, they're crimped. But he's soldered, this side here is soldered straight on. So you would have to desolder it probably is the safest thing to do there. Uh, anyway, let's just see if we can lift this board up. Bear in mind, we've still got the volume thing connected. We've got this IDC cable here. But I might just be able to just uh, flip it over a little bit so we can have a look on the underside there. Yeah, let's just carefully flip that over. So I'm holding the board up here off the carpet, but what I will do is just carry the whole lot over to the mat 
uh, and continue looking at it on the mat. So the underside is very good there, but this side is horrendous. So let's have a go at trying to clean this up initially. You can see how dirty that is, but that's probably mostly the solder that's uh, coming away with the vinegar a little bit. So just using the fiberglass pen, let's uh, see if that makes any difference. Yeah, it's making a little bit of difference there. Uh, it's making a lot of difference actually, can you see that? Normally the first thing I would do is go, go into something like this with an eraser, but because it's corroded, an eraser is not going to get that off. You've got to use something like this here. And we'll need to inspect the uh, traces that lead to these in a minute just to make sure they aren't adversely affected. You can see the solder points there. Let's just try and carefully go over those. Yeah, it's starting to come off though. Hopefully you can see the difference there. You can look at these four pins. They're a lot better than the other ones. And I'll give you a close-up uh, before and after. So that's one. That's the one on the right, and that's the one on the left. Well, that was very therapeutic, actually. You know, so I went up and down each one of them here like this. And then I've also gone just gently across like that. Especially at the bottom side, where you can't always get right to the bottom when you're going up and down. And then I've gone gently over the uh, via points here. You've got to be careful not to go too much for too long there, because you could wear all the solder mask off. Anyway, a bit of uh, vinegar here. Let's uh, just try and collect this and see how much better that is. Yeah, that's looking a lot better. Look. Yeah, that one's looking an awful lot better as well. So yeah, very therapeutic, because watch, you just put the uh, fiberglass pen on there. Yeah, that pin on the right is not as good as the one on the left, but very little work is required and they come up really good. One thing I've noticed is fiberglass pens, the bristles, they're not all the same. This one wears down really quick, but it's super abrasive compared to the previous refill I had. I think this is the worst of the three, actually, because there's still some really dirty bits there. Like, yeah, the underside's much better. So on the top side here, I am going to go over these with a bit of solder and flux actually. Can you see? You can see a little bit of copperish colour there. It's because the corrosion was so bad, obviously, that I've scratched a tiny bit of the surface off. So I would just get a little bit of flux on there, I don't need a lot. And I'll we'll just get a tiny bit of solder onto the tip here. Should have a larger tip really for this, to get the heat uh, to spread properly. But nevertheless, if we just have a slide, you can see get them coming up like new look. See that? Those were like copper coloured before. It's important you get these uh, super flat though, so do make sure you're using braid. Or just try using the solder on its own. Yeah, there you go. You can see after wiping away the flux and stuff, it's uh, it's not bad that. It's not bad that at all. You can see it's, uh, you know, it's got some marks and things on it. You're never going to get away from that, but in general, that's a lot better. These ones don't really need it as much as that first one because there were bits of copper showing on that first connector there, but... Anyway, it will make these uh, a bit more reliable. It gives me an opportunity to show you comparison here. So you can see this has been cleaned up. I've used vinegar, IPA, fiberglass pen, IPA. Uh, look at the colour. Can you see a colour difference? It's like this looks quite dull and this looks really silvery and shiny. There are some imperfections on here and I'm not finished cleaning this yet. It's a little bit sticky so I'll get some more IPA on but yeah hopefully you'll be able to see the difference between where it's been retinned and uh, as it was with a bit of corrosion just wiped and washed off. There we go okay if there's a final wipe with uh, some uh, paper towel here and some IPA uh, and on the edge as well because you can get bits of flux on here and round here. And the other thing I did is fold the paper towel and get it between the little slot there and go up and down because you get bits of rubber or flux or whatever it is you've been using to clean it stuck in there if you're not careful. Anyway that is a lot better now I think. So you could remove everything here and wash this in the sink as I've shown on lots of the videos but I'm just going to just clean it this way here look it's pretty dirty just with a bit of IPA here and uh, just have a really good wipe around everything. And it's pretty clean already but I'm just going to use uh, cotton buds and IPA just go over the main areas of the PCB and then I'll clean over the tops of the chips. There we go, so 20 minutes with the cotton buds, it's looking pretty clean. Uh, now, obviously there are different ways of cleaning the board up like this. You could just literally pour IPA and have a good brush around like this. But there's lots of flux on the underside, so you'll just get flux everywhere and the IPA just makes streaky, horrible messes. 
if you go over it with the uh, presentation is important to you you want it to look you know super glossy and shiny and no streaks and stuff like that the best way is just with individual cotton buds from my experience um, it really depends on what it is you're trying to clean really and how badly dirty it is with some IPA and uh, we'll just go over the tops of these so that's the how as I mentioned earlier it's like a, a gal programmable part it's just going to be doing some address decoding probably something to do with the additional RAM I would think because this has got 128k versus the 464 that's got 64k you can see this ground concept here you might want to pull that up a little bit so that when the keyboard's in it makes a connection with the keyboard that's the uh, floppy controller I think it's like an equivalent of a 765 down here we've got the uh, data separator and yeah, just clean over here so that's the uh, graphics chip it's the same chip that's used on the BBC as far as I remember and the PIA and the AY sound chip I may need to just uh, quickly just dust over this because I'm gonna have little bits of uh, you know paper towel on here aren't I? and then our two ROMs and our Z80 as I mentioned in the 464 video it's uh, it runs slightly faster than the Spectrum. The Spectrum's like three and a half megahertz, this runs at four. But uh, speed isn't everything, obviously, you know. Uh, the thing with the Spectrum, the graphics were a bit faster, I think, because of the way the ULA worked for the video side of things. On the CPC, I think the uh, bottleneck is the CRTC. Uh, did I get that acronym right? The graphics chip, basically, there. Um, but you can do some nice things with the graphics chip, like split the screen mode and stuff, lots of games will use more than one video mode to display, you know, like the top half of the screen is in one mode and the bottom half is in another. So it's, uh, it's just the smaller chips now really, like the, the RAM and stuff around here, might just go with some of these with the cotton bud instead. Well, let's just see if we can, uh, can we pull that volume thing off? Yeah we can, look, it just pulls off like that. Yeah, it's not keyed or anything, so you can have that a different ways around. We'll just get a little bit of contact cleaner into there. Before we do that I'll just clean that PCB. And we'll clean around the surface of it as well because it's a bit dusty on there. And just get a tiny bit of contact cleaner onto that. That should do. And then just give it a bit of a rotate and clean off the excess in a minute. That's it, just push us on like that and just give it a bit of a move around like that. The video connector probably won't get any bad solder points on it, but the power connector uh, can do. You can always swap the, these connectors, power connector as well, if it's uh, a problem on yours. And likewise, you might want to get contact cleaner into these things here actually. Um, can you see that pin there? Looks a bit grey. Yeah, I can do a bit of that. Yeah, so I've just cleaned the inside of that with a bit of deoxit. Uh, that pin, as you can see, is looking a little bit grey. Now the power switch here, these can be a common source of failure. So what you can do with these is uh, strip it down completely. Can you see the metal uh, tabs here? If you were to bend those straight upwards, yeah, the two on that side and the two on that side, you can pull this metal fascia off and the button will come out and the little plates or whatever that slides up and down there will come out as well and you can then clean the contacts on the underside of the switch and clean the plates up but I don't see any point in doing that while this one is uh, good as it is now what I will do is just get a little bit of deoxy in there and then just do a little bit of that and you could do the same thing yourself that would save you taking it to pieces but the reason why I don't want to go in there now when there's nothing wrong with it is because when you bend these tabs ultimately you can only bend them I think like once maybe twice if you're lucky so then the next time you come in to do it you won't be able to do it. The tabs will break off and then the switch won't hold together. So I would only do that if your switch is not working, to be fair. I'd just get some deoxit in there or contact cleaner. You could spray it. You may think it's not going to go in, but if you spray some contact cleaner in there and do a bit of that, trust me, it will get into the back there. And more often than not, that's all you need to do. And since this is working, that is all I am going to do. Just literally a bit of that. So done the exact same thing I did on the 464 there. The, if you look at the board layout here, you've got the same board. The uh, one, two, three, four, 
fifth one from the left there, that's five volts, and the one next to it is ground. This is on the underside of the gate array. And looking up the board from the top here, it's from this side here, so you count one, two, three, four, five, that's your VCC, and your ground is next to it. And we'll just confirm that, if we test from the ground there, I'm at a 7.4 series chip, uh, it should be the sixth one, one, two, three, four, five, six, there we go, that's ground, that's 5 volts, and I can confirm that, you can't quite see, and I can confirm that by measuring from there, so yeah, it's uh, 5 volts and ground. And in case you're thinking, well, Hamstrad didn't uh, see any need to put caps on there, that's true, but there are very few caps on the board. Now, on this board, compared to the uh, 464, there are quite a few more caps, but they're all up near the tape area there, you know, where the tape interface is. There is one tiny, tiny, weedy little cap just where the power goes in, somewhere around there. I haven't checked to see where it is, what rail it sits on or whatever. But uh, yeah, adding a little bit more smoothing, or a little bit, not more, a little bit of smoothing with uh, an electrolytic like that. 47 microfarad. Got my Panasonic low, uh, super low ESR ones, you know, FR series again. Low. One thing I would say is the video on this is a bit softer than the 464. I like the clarity and sharpness of my 464. It just looks a tiny, tiny, tiny bit more blurry on this system. Yeah, that'll do. So the final thing before I get the lid on, I'm going to get some little baby heat sinks onto these things. Gate array in particular, because those gate arrays do die and uh, super annoying when they do, although we might get uh, an FPGA or CPLD base replacement in the near future, that wouldn't surprise me, it's uh, totally in the realms of possibility. I can't imagine it being overly complex in terms of what's going on inside that gate array. Well, certainly from the clock division side of things, but that's not all it does. Um, so anyway, I'll just cut some of this to size. It's 3M thermal back in here, so... And just adding heat sinks here, I may just extend the life of this system, especially if it's used for prolonged periods of time. I will be using this for long periods of time, I think. So I stuck a few more heat sinks on than I originally intended. The AY chips, they do tend to fail, and uh, some of these things may not get that hot, but you're just kind of trying to fight entropy here by uh, adding heat sinks. If these do fail, Novabug had a video where one of those had failed. I think uh, it handles some of the keyboard inputs as well, isn't it? It's not just the sound chip. And a small one on the uh, floppy controller chip there, and one on the data separator. Just because, like I say, some of those things might be hard to find in future. And we'll just get the screws back in on the underside. And we're all done. So I'll admit, I had to take that to pieces a certain time. At the back here, this part here was kind of bulging a little bit. It was like really weird. Can you see? It's almost like the case is a little bit deformed as well. It's, I don't know, it's like had an impact or something. And I've checked, it's not the heat sinks. And it's not the caps making uh, any, having any effect on the board. The board is, the whole thing is just slightly warped. I've inspected down there to see where those two caps were fitted, and there's enough clearance, so it's not that. Um, but anyway, I did manage to get it to go back together okay here. I just rooted the wires and flattened the wires down. Uh, so something there must have been trapped. So the final thing are these two screws here. Can you see? The heads are a little bit dirty on them, so I'm going to go clean those up just to see if they'll go any cleaner than that. So just like I said earlier, you could uh, wash the whole thing in the sink. There's plenty of uh, different ways of cleaning something like this. I'm just using some soapy water here, just uh, gently going over this. So yeah, I mean it's got some scratches, as you can see, little marks and dinks and stuff. So I've had a quick clean of the top and the keys there, in between the keys and all different angles. Just the odd bit of dirt like that there that's wedged in there, so I'm just going to use a toothbrush. There we go, it's coming out, look, it's gone. Yeah, just to get into the edge. So there are a few places like that, just around the edge of these uh, bits that are sunk, sunk in. Like this side here, this corner is a bit dirty. Finally here, a bit of uh, back to black. I don't need a lot, which is a good job because it's nearly out actually. And I'm just uh, wipe that in, I'll wipe the excess off. Gives it a nice uh, glossiness. And there we go, she's good as new. It's amazing how far away I've had to get to be able to get most of it on camera. You can see it still doesn't quite fit. <laughs> We're still squeezed out the sides here.
the public trust. Protect the innocent. Uphold the law. And finally, we are all done. So thank you very much to Mike Pearman for providing this. I love this. This is another cherished item in my collection. The one thing I will say is I've kind of got a bit more love, just a little bit, for the 464 because I just like There's something about the colours and things, the colour of the keys and things, and even the tape deck on the 464. I don't know. There's just something more nostalgic for me personally about the 464, but uh, the CPC 6128 is perhaps the best machine to go for as your first CPC, just because you've got everything there, you know, you can connect to tape deck, you've got your disk drive, you can replace the disk drive with a GoTek as we did in this video, but you've got the 128k RAM which uh, just saves you trying to find a memory expansion for a 464. The other benefit of fitting a GoTek, you no longer need to power the 12 volt side, that is just not used at all. And I've been powering this with the uh, MP1 power supply there, that just provides 5 volts. I covered that in a previous video. So I hope you found the video interesting, I'd like to give a special thanks to my Patreons. If you'd like to support the channel, please see the links down below for coffee or Patreon, you can just buy me a coffee. Every donation of just like a dollar helps uh, significantly with these videos. So yeah, thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing, I'll catch you in the next video.